uh, that there is no, nothing at the end that actually helps us to do something with it. Yeah? And uh, so uh, that's the uh, moment, so to say, when we try to help them and solve the problems they have uh, with their uh, text data sources. So the traditional systems, most of them, if not all, uh, work based on a statistical approach. So fundamentally, a statistical way of handling text is to uh, split the text into its words, uh, count the occurrence, the number of times every word occurs there, and then do some statistical magic to find out which are the important parts and which are the less important parts uh, of, of the text that you're actually looking at. Uh, so as it is with uh, statistics, uh, it works uh, in the uh, so to say beginning, but it's very hard to improve it beyond a certain quality that you can actually reach uh, quite straightforward. Uh, so we all know that the search engines uh, work well up to a certain level, but then every improvement, so to say, beyond, let's say, some 60% uh, uh, of precision uh, becomes extremely expensive and uh, you need uh, external data, metadata, you need ontologies, you need to bring in people who actually create uh, gold standards so that the machine learning algorithms uh, have a way of figuring out which is the right answer and so on. So all of that basically makes the traditional approach uh, for processing text data, especially on a large scale, uh, very complicated and uh, very fragile also in a, in a certain sense, and in the end, uh, for the business application, makes it very expensive. Um, so fundamentally, the reason why we do statistics on words uh, is basically because that's the approach we typically do in science. So whenever we don't really know about the theory, about th how things really work, uh, we, we just start to observe the phenomena that we have in front of us and we start making uh, statistics about this. Uh, so uh, the same thing happened, of course, uh, with the question on how does a human actually represent language uh, within the brain and how could uh, a possible representation uh, be created and even more uh, a representation that could be actually used in a, in a computer to, to do some processing about this. Uh, so how are we present, representing words in our minds, uh, for example? So these are all big questions and uh, the solution we actually came up with uh, is a solution that was, as I said, uh, uh, rooted, so to say, in the theory um, of Jeff Hawkins on, on how the neocortex does the data processing. <coughs> so what are these constraints? So the, the neocortex is a 2D two-dimensional sheet of, uh, 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 of modular assemblies, so to say, um, and, uh, which is, uh, and, uh, and another aspect that is extremely important uh, is that the brain is actually not um, a processor, so to say. It's, it's very often uh, compared to a computer, but it's very different from a computer, and uh, the reason why is because the brain is a memory system, not a processor. Um, what, does, uh, what it does is it stores pattern sequences. So all the senses that uh, bring data, so to say, to our brain uh, are end up at our brain in form of patterns. And what the neocortex actually does is to learn what pattern comes after which other pattern. And uh, by doing this, uh, it can be demonstrated that you can basically explain most of the, of the faculties that uh, the neocortex has by just uh, doing the simple thing of storing specific sequences of pattern and knowing what pattern leads to what other pattern. Um, so these patterns happen to have a very specific uh, data format that is called uh, a sparse distributed representation. So this is a long string of bits where each of the bits basically corresponds to something real, uh, some, uh, a bit of uh, real semantic information that actually came to the brain through one of the senses. So uh, one pixel in our sight, one uh, frequency band in hearing, even if we touch our skin, uh, we can actually locate where we have been touched. And this is again a bit with, let's say, some uh, location information that reaches the neocortex. Uh, so one thing is clear, we have to create a representation of language that also has this format. 
Um, in order to do this, we make a very simple, so to say, um, uh, intu intuitive approach. Uh, regardless if we read some text, if we listen to someone speak, uh, or if we, even if we use uh, braille, so to say, so we use the, the touching sense to read, at some point a word appears in our mind, uh, which in the end means that there has to be some patch of neocortex at some point where a word is encoded regardless by which channel it actually came up uh, to the neocortex. And exactly this uh, word uh, SDR uh, uh, layer or patch, that's what our technology models, so to say, in order to find uh, a, a practical representation uh, for text. So how do we as humans learn uh, language uh, is by just being exposed to it. Yeah? Since uh, we've been children, uh, people uh, kept talking to us uh, in school, they made us to learn read and write and everything. Um, and along our lives, we were exposed to a certain number of utterances, let's say. Yeah? So we generalize, uh, the utterances could have been written down, but in the end, we get little bits of information that we can actually correlate with what happens or, or find out what, what matters about them. Um, and we perceive them and we store them, so to say, in a semantic map somewhere in our brain. And uh, a process that happens while we store the utterances is that we always keep looking, did I hear something similar to what I'm hearing now already? And if so, then I store this little utterance that I am listening now next to the ones that have been similar in the past. And in the end, if you do this over time, over many, many years, uh, you end up having a map in your brain where the topics of the utterances are organized in a topographic manner. So uh, whenever you uh, speak about ice cream, that is a specific area on the map that is uh, uh, associated with it. Whenever you speak about your pet, it's another area. Uh, and this is the semantic map uh, that we use to generate and to understand language. The interesting thing is that if we grow up in a very similar context, so let's say in the same city, uh, we happen to have very similar utterances, especially uh, if, if you take into account that we have, might have been exposed to, let's say, uh, uh, 5 million utterances uh, up to our 20th birthday, let's say, uh, then most of those utterances are similar even across individuals, which means that the semantic map that is generated from it is similar depending on the so to say, similar experience of individuals. And that is the fundamental way that allows us to speak to other people. If everyone would have a completely different semantic map, uh, there, was, there would be no way in agreeing of what a certain word could mean or, uh, or, or a thought that would be expressed would not be understood by, uh, by, my, uh, uh, by, by another person. And so that's exactly the thing we try to simulate. We take a large collection of text uh, which simulates basically the collection of the utterances that our virtual word layer uh, has been exposed to. And we calculate, uh, uh, using a clustering algorithm, we try to group those utterances together if they talk about something similar, and we try to keep them apart uh, if they are very dis dissimilar. And this uh, uh, practically produces a semantic map, which is at the foundation of our technology. Uh, based on this semantic map, I can say two things. I know all the words that my map knows, because I know all the words that we have been exposed to. And as the brain, as I said, is a memory system, all those words are, so to say, stored in the map, and they have a position on where uh, they belong. And that's uh, what we uh, sort of create by creating the, the, the database of all the learned words, more or less. And that's, in the end, uh, the way how a word, for example, looks like. If uh, you create a binary representation, so this is a, a binary vector that has 128 by 128 bits, and every location on this vector uh, um, specifies a certain context. So you can actually click on, on, on every dot, and you can look at the words that are behind that dot, corresponding to a specific context. And the nice thing about a representation like this is that suddenly 
uh, like magic, uh, similar things or words that mean similar things look similar. So we can just look at the word organ, for example, and we can see that uh, organ has obviously uh, several different senses. Uh, so there is one sense of an organ being a, a keyboard, so to say, which makes it very similar to what a piano is. And if we compare organ to piano, we see that there are two specific clusters that are nearly the same between the two. In the same way, organ could also mean, of course, the organ in the body. So if I compare the fingerprint, uh, so we call that fingerprint, in fact, the binary representation of the word. Uh, so if I compare my word organ to the word liver, I see that now in a different location, because as you remember, every location has specific topics behind it. So in a different location from the piano location, I have again a patch that obviously has an overlay with uh, the word organ and liver. And as uh, in the same way, there is another patch that uh, shows an overlay between organ and church and many more. Yeah? Uh, and this is in fact true for every word. And so at this step, we create, so to say, the list of all the words that we have learned in our semantic space. Each of the words has a representation like this. And uh, like that, the words become comparable by simply making an overlay and counting the bits uh, that actually do uh, overlay between the two. Uh, here is just um, a, um, a demonstration on how, how how it looks if depending on what kind of information you have been exposed to. So let's assume the word uh, cholecystitis, which is a, a, a word from medicine, and I use a semantic space that was trained on Wikipedia. And you see this on the upper uh, region, and you see that this is a very sparse representation because Wikipedia doesn't use very often the word cholecystitis. It does, but only a couple of times. If, in the contrary, instead of training it on the Wikipedia data, I train the system on the, um, a collection from the National Library of Science, of medicine, uh, you see that now I have a fingerprint that has many more dots, because the actual word occurs many, many times in many different contexts. But what is interesting is you should be able to see that the two have the same, still the same topology. So you could make an overlay between the two and you would see that basically the Wikipedia fingerprint is completely contained, or nearly completely contained, in uh, the fingerprint uh, trained on the, um, on, the, on the National Library of Science. Uh, the point is that the selection of documents that you train the system with initially is the only, so to say, uh, tuning that you need to do for such a system. There is no other parameters or whatever uh, that would be needed to fine-tune to make the system work. It's just basically a content management task to select proper training material in proper in the sense of it has to be representative in the, in the semantic space that you want to work in. Um, here is another aspect uh, where uh, fingerprints uh, behave differently. Uh, we have trained uh, different retinas, we call it retina because it's, it's uh, like a sensory organ for text, so we call this uh, 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 semantic space a retina. So we have trained retinas on uh, different Wikipedias in different languages, and, uh, what, and we have uh, found a way of aligning the different semantic spaces, so that the topology that I have in the English version corresponds in terms of meaning, in terms of context, uh, to the one in French, Spanish, Russian, and so on, 20, 20 languages we have done so far. And what you can see is that the word philosophy, uh, regardless of what language you use, gets a very similar, in fact, if you look closely, you will see it's not exactly the same pattern, but it's nearly the same pattern. The reason why it's not exactly the same pattern is because uh, uh, the word philosophy in English has a, a little different meaning also than, for example, uh, in Chinese. Yeah. And those, so to say, subtle dif differences uh, are reflected in the fact that they have like 90% of the dots actually overlap. Um, so this semantic fingerprinting uh, basically is a process by which you can transform words, and as we will see later, text uh, into this representational format of a semantic fingerprint. 
And from that moment on, there is no need to do any statistics. The only thing we need to do to infer and to use this kind of representation is to do Boolean arithmetic, which uh, you probably know is uh, about the fastest you can do uh, with a computer. Uh, so that's the, the one and only, uh, so to say, operation we use in this space. Uh, is by doing the similarity between two words or, in general, the, between two fingerprints. So the only processing, so to say, that occurs with this memory uh, that we have is a processing of analogy. And there is a lot of uh, philosophical literature out there that, in fact, uh, uh, strengthens the, the approach that what our brains are doing is, in fact, processing by analogy constantly. Um, so here, for example, we uh, compare the word cat to the word dog. Uh, we see that they have uh, many regions where they overlap. Uh, we can count the number of, uh, uh, of pixels that actually overlap and have about 38%. Uh, but still, and that's, so to say, the power of the representation, there can be areas that are specific to either cat or dog. Uh, and I can show all of those aspects in the same time, so to say, when I look uh, at the fingerprint as a whole. Another very interesting functionality that only uses one function, namely the similarity, is uh, the automatic disambiguation of words. So let's take the word apple. I can now ask my retina, what is the closest matching fingerprint uh, corresponding to the fingerprint of the word apple? And as we have trained this on Wikipedia, uh, the answer is of course the word computer. Uh, so computer is, so to say, the closest fingerprint matching the fingerprint of Apple. What I now do is I say, I take all the dots that are in common between Apple and computer, so all the computer dots in Apple, and I take them away from the Apple fingerprint. And now I ask again, and what is now the most similar word? And I get fruit as the answer. If I now take away the fruit dots, uh, it tells me records. Records because there has been Apple records, uh, from the Beatles and so on. Uh, again, I mean, I agree this is specific for the knowledge that is embedded in Wikipedia, but I can do this operation with any word and I will find any sense of any word depending on a common semantic space that we agree on. If, if we could have done this, for example, with uh, medical terms by having trained instead on the Wikipedia, we would have trained on uh, medical literature, I could uh, disambiguate uh, cholecystitis and find out what are all the contexts that this uh, word is used. So what you can do based on these uh, Boolean operations is basically uh, what we call meaning-based computing. So I can say Jaguar minus Porsche equals Tiger, which again is I take away all the Porsche dots, the, the dots that correspond to a fast and uh, expensive car. I take them away from the word Jaguar and what remains is basically the big cat aspects uh, of the word. So now the next step uh, is in fact to uh, apply this whole concept to sentences, paragraphs, text, books, libraries, whatever uh, uh, you want. Uh, and it's, it's, it's straightforward, simple. You take a sentence, you convert each word in the sentence into its corresponding fingerprint. And then you stack the fingerprints up and you make a big or. You basically add them all together. Uh, and uh, what you have then is a fingerprint that has again the same size as the initial word fingerprints, which means they stay compatible. You can compare a word to a sentence fingerprint, for example. The only thing that happens, of course, if you add them together, is that the text fingerprint will fill up. Yeah? So it will lose uh, the sparseness. Uh, in order to prevent this, uh, we make a very simple approach of resparsifying the sentence fingerprint is because, as you can imagine, there will be little bars, so to say, starting to grow depending on how many words you stack uh, one on top of the other. And many of the words in a sentence tend to have certain pixels together because in a sentence you don't just scramble any words together without a sense, but you make a sentence by adding together words that have sort of a meaning uh, that goes through them. So uh, if I would make a sentence using the word apple, and let's say three words later there would be the word uh, iPhone, because uh, uh, I make a sentence about this, 
then the word iPhone would have pixels shared with the Apple side, with the computer side of Apple. So those pixels will be higher. And what I do in, when I've done all my oring together, I just define the threshold there so that I have again a sparsity of 2%. And what happens is of course that all the other dots that are not relevant in the context of the sentence will be filtered out. So there is a sort of an implicit disambiguation while creating a text filter. And that's one of the reasons why we can follow uh, uh, someone speak, even in very bad hearing condition, and we will be never or nearly never confused about what he actually means. It's because we constantly add up the, 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 the fingerprints of every word that comes along, and we only consider those which, which are matching with the ones that we have heard previously. And that's basically without an effort, as you can see. So again, uh, the resulting text fingerprint uh, behaves exactly like the word fingerprint. So I can uh, compare them. So here we have a uh, sentence, teens like playing good music with their mobile phones. And you can also consume chart hits with your notebook. And you see that there is an overlap uh, in semantic distance uh, of 27%. Uh, if you change this second sentence to something completely different, uh, first of all, you can even see it, if you look at the, at the overlay there, uh, that uh, uh, most of the dots do, do not really overlay, and you end up with only 9%. So one thing you can do with this uh, basic mechanism uh, is to create a search engine, for example. So uh, assume you have uh, one million documents that you want to search through in a, in a, let's say, intelligent and fast way. You create a fingerprint for each of the documents in your collection, uh, you then create a fingerprint of what you are looking for. So this could be either another document that is sort of an example document, or you literally type in, I'm interested in blah, blah, blah. Uh, you create a fingerprint of that, and you then calculate the distance to each of the uh, uh, index, so to say, of the fingerprinted documents that you have in your collection. And you have directly, through the distance of the overlap, you have a direct ranking mechanism in the result set, yeah, which is also different than in the traditional search approaches. And furthermore, you could, as a user, uh, specify specific documents that represent the kind of information that you're interested in. Let's assume you have indexed patent documents, and you have two users. One is a researcher uh, interested in science and technical stuff, and the other is a patent lawyer interested in more the patent language kind of stuff, they could, both of them, cast the same query to the same document collection, but give another reference, so to say, as their preferred kind of information, and that ranking, so to say, of the results would be done according to their interests that they actually have. So this is, so to say, for the first time that you can have a search engine that is really individualized uh, and provides, uh, ex uh, so to say, results that are specific for a user uh, doing a, a certain query. <coughs> a second uh, prototype um, activity that you can do with this is classification. Um, so here, for example, what we do, uh, we have trained on Wikipedia again, uh, and what we want to do is to provide animal names and we want to figure out if they are mammals or not. Uh, the, the classifier fingerprint, the one that all the animal names are compared to, is generated by literally taking the words mammal, mammals, and mammalian, creating a fingerprint of these three words, and then comparing dog, cow, elephant, and so on uh, with this fingerprint. And what is interesting is that there is a hot zone in there uh, that you see this after doing like 10 examples, you figure out where this hot zone is. Uh, it's very, again, very intuitive. And you could even uh, reduce your comparison to say, if there are more than three dots in this hot zone, then it's a mammal. Uh, and that's, so to say, just because all of that information was initially in Wikipedia and was sort of carried over into the language model that we, we have created. Uh, so there is no, uh, so to say, uh, uh, graph database or whatever uh, ontological tagging necessary. It's really the information that was gener generically contained in the text is sort of integrated into the representation that we have here. 
again, a, a good explanation why we are so smart. Yeah, it's not because we have so much computing power, we have just a very smart way of storing stuff and being able to compare and to figure out which is the relevant answer I'm looking for. Um, so the performance, uh, uh, you can average this of course, uh, you can do, there are two, so to say, uh, basic measurements that are relevant here. Uh, one is how long does it take to convert a piece of text into the fingerprint? Uh, and the other one is how many comparisons of fingerprints uh, can I do? Uh, so for example, uh, an average on a single core of a server class uh, computer uh, converts about 10 megabytes per second. So that might not seem a lot, uh, but you, can, you will see very, very fast um, that this is actually a very high throughput because there is a lot of, of language relevant sorting and figuring out that happens uh, in, this, in the same time. And so uh, per core 10 megabytes and 150,000 uh, comparisons per core per second. Uh, if, uh, as we have done now, we have integrated uh, our system into Spark. So we have, so to say, a scalable cluster behind this. And the nice thing is that both of the operations, the conversion operation into a fingerprint, as well as the comparison, are both independent. You can do that like 10,000 times in parallel. They don't interfere with each other. So if I have, for example, a cluster of 10 8 core machines, I can suddenly convert 800 megabytes per second, which starts to be, so to say, serious amounts of data. Uh, if you want to do this with a, with a traditional system that needs to create the large floating point matrices on the fly, this takes forever. Yeah, so if you ever have watched, uh, so to say, the time it takes to, to index just a, a large uh, a search collection, for example, uh, you never reach uh, numbers like 800 megabytes a second. And uh, on the comparison side, I can do 12 million comparisons per second. So on such a cluster, I can basically guarantee that any query, any search query you could cast to this cluster, if the number of documents is smaller than 12 million, will therefore stay under a second. So suddenly, uh, the time it needs to search for a document in a collection is not depending anymore on the complexity of the documents and, and, and all this stuff, but you can really make the straightforward uh, calculus, so to say, that if I have a cluster of this size, if I have a collection of that size, the, the, the finding the right answer will always take the same time. And the advantage of doing so is that suddenly you can, so to say, scale uh, up to a level where you can do real-time processing of text data. So, to be honest, nowadays uh, people struggle to process text data at all. Uh, not even thinking of processing it or making it searchable in real time. So, uh, for example, there are two, so to say, standard setups uh, where we use the system. One is filtering. Uh, so the goal would be, for example, uh, let's take the Twitter firehose. So this is basically the backbone of all the Twitter messages that go to the system, which normally is between uh, 20, I think, and, and 50,000 messages a second. And they want to filter out every message that somehow relates to smartphones. Because I have a smartphone company uh, and I want to collect this data to do later on analytics on it or, or whatever. Uh, if I want to do this, I need to have a system that is capable of filtering the Twitter firehose in real time. Because whenever I have a lag, uh, I cannot buffer the data because uh, as I would store it, there is even more data coming in. So you have to keep up with the stream as it comes in. And uh, what we can do here is uh, real-time filtering. And we have done the experiment. Uh, we can do the real-time filtering for a topic like uh, smartphones or whatever other topic uh, on a MacBook Pro in real-time on the Twitter firewalls. So IBM sells uh, a similar system that is, I think, two racks of servers uh, to do this based on, on keywords. Uh, here, by reducing, in one sense, reducing the amount of data to fingerprints, but even more important, by maintaining the size of the data always the same, 
allows you to optimize the processing in such a way that you can actually handle this kind of throughput on a, on a very small machine. Uh, the second aspect uh, is the search uh, metaphor I, I showed before. Suddenly, when I have a cluster that basically uh, I can tune it to any speed I, I want it to go, I can maybe even consider not indexing my data anymore. Yeah? So it might be cheaper, so to say, uh, to brute force crawl through all my collection in, in terms of fingerprints than doing all the overhead. So the, in, in, in my experience, the most expensive part of an enterprise search system is the index management. Yeah? It's creating the index. Uh, it's sharding it across uh, different cluster entities and stuff like that. If, if you do the, the, the math, by the end of the day, I'm pretty sure that about 60% of the cost is just the management of the index. So imagine if you could do a search engine just without the index. The other advantage is, of course, like two milliseconds after a document is stored on your system, users can find it. You don't have to wait until tonight, until the re-index job starts and blah. Uh, Data comes in and data becomes findable. Same way, of course, if data becomes irrelevant, you can delete it out and it will not be found anymore uh, and not give you an index link uh, in, in, in empty space. So, so all these are uh, things that become feasible, uh, which are necessary to do actually big text data in, in a similar way as we do uh, big data in general. Uh, and all of that just because we try to copy what our brain is doing. Um, so you find, uh, and, and the concept of using similarity, the concept of handling text by analogy, allows you to do all sorts of typical uh, business problems. So you can locate documents on the web or locally. Uh, you can match people. Just imagine uh, I take a LinkedIn profile of a person, I create a fingerprint uh, of this LinkedIn profile and I compare it to another link, uh, LinkedIn fingerprint. I can match, so to say, on a very fine-grained level, uh, how much certain two people would have to tell each other. Yeah. Simply by taking the description of a person uh, in a system like LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever. So there is no need for uh, creating a database, uh, extracting the features, making the features comparable. No, you just put in the plain text and you compare the resulting fingerprint. Uh, same thing with products. You can take the fingerprint of the product description and you can see what other product does make a lot of sense together with this one. Yeah? So instead, like it happened to me very often, uh, you buy an espresso machine at Amazon and then for a half a year, the only ads you get is about espresso machines, but I'm the last one who's going to buy a second one. Yeah? So why aren't they doing a decalcifier or whatever uh, other product that could fit well? Uh, the reason is because in the current uh, way how these things are done, it would have been uh, necessary to enter this information in the catalog, basically by hand or, or by some semi-manual system. But if you have uh, 100 million products in the database, uh, this is a never-ending uh, job, so to say. So by doing this, uh, in, by using, so to say, the description of the product would be uh, a much more effective way. Competitive monitor, uh, uh, monitoring